Welcome to another episode of the podcast, and today I had the luxury to be here with Tom Dixon, the CEO and founder of Blendtec. So Tom, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to be here, Jimmy. Oh yeah, I'm so excited. We just did a tour of the entire facility. I gotta say, this is one of the most fascinating uh, businesses I've ever watched, how you work and how you built this whole thing. I mean, because you're an inventor first, right? I mean, yes. essentially. Yeah, engineer, inventor. And marketer. Marketing, yeah. <laughs> yes. Marketing genius. It was an accident. <laughs> yeah, no, and we'll, I want to get into that story. A lot of you might have seen the Will It Blend videos. I remember I watched the first one. I mean, it was probably one of the first 10 videos I ever watched on YouTube was you guys blending iPhones and golf balls and baseball, I think, was the one, my, one that my brother always would show us. And um, But I want to back up a little bit because as fascinating as your story is, um, you, in fact, you just became a... Uh, Great grandpa. That's correct. Yeah, and you were too young to be a great grandpa. But how is uh, that react? Because you're now the CEO. You, you came back on the role of CEO. Um, That's correct. Your CEO and great grandpa. How do you have time to do all these different <laughs> things? Yeah, with uh, now with being a great grandpa. That's number. Four, that's number forty-five. Oh wow! So it was a real blessing to have that little little gal. But yeah, we have um, ten children and their spouses, and then. Uh, and then we just had twins, 40, 40, uh, 43 and 44, and now we just had our first great-grandchild. And I, I was terrorized to watch my grandson uh, blow in her face at, at six weeks old and throw her in our swimming pool <laughs> and watch her do this. <laughs> and, but it's amazing, uh, so they're teaching her how to swim well. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. Did you involve your grandkids at all in the business at this point, or do you um, have them in the videos, any of the videos that you make? The kids have been, there's 165 videos out. Some of the kids have been in videos. Right. When I'm competing, like when they're doing a Rubik's Cube, and see how fast you can do it. Well, they do that pretty fast, and, and we speed it up to boot. But then I blend my Rubik's Cube. That's how I take care of it, <laughs> my love. solution. But yeah, the, so the kids are in it. Uh, my oldest son is running our, really, I'm the CEO, and then we have a council, really, that runs the, the, um, the company. It's like the LDS church. We don't quite have 12, but we have four. <laughs> okay. And they, they different uh, aspects of the business, but they get together at 8.30 every morning and they really do everything. So oh, I right. can just come and go when I want and they do all the, and I can trust them. It's my son, sure. my grandson, uh, my grandkids, um, some of them are involved. In a major way, both engineering and well, excuse me. One of the machines you showed me, your grandson's helping build this thing, right? So, did yes. they did you teach them how to invent and engineer and do these things, or is that just something they picked up watching grandpa along the way? It's in their blood, <laughs> it sounds <laughs> and like they it. have the opportunity. There's so much to work with here, so they've been able to grow up here, even though they've been in Texas and Vermont um, or Virginia helping Mitt Romney on his campaign and. Uh, but no, they've been very helpful, and they're back, and they're going to BYU and UBU and and uh, Cedar City, and, and yeah. so okay. they're, they're involved. Well, I, what a great opportunity for them! I know when I was little, one of the first things I wanted I wanted to be an inventor when I was young, but I would just basically take a VCR that would no longer work and start tinkering with. I didn't even know what anything was, but I just was. I always was fascinated with it, so it's really cool. I got to tour the facility with you and it was fun to see just how much goes into engineering each of these parts and you guys have done a really good job of bringing most of the manufacturing back here to the states. Tell us how, what was, why was your decision to do that because almost everything's built here and right here in Utah, right? Yes and, and from the very beginning, my first job out of BYU, um, it's either make or buy decisions. You make as much as you can um, in-house, certainly keep it from, from Asia. And we. We've been, I mean, not that we don't build things in Asia, especially our molds, because nobody in the, this country can do as good a job, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and certainly for as little money. But that's where we build our injection molds for making our plastic parts and so on. But no, we're an American company. Uh, we're the most American-made countertop kitchen appliance in the world. I mean, right here in Utah. So we can take copper out of Kennecott, Rio Tinto, ship it to the Midwest, draw it into wire, and then wind our own motors. And we can make a blender with our latest $10 million worth of automation, 16 robots, in eight seconds. 
So when you can go from scratch, and so, but we do. Nobody can do that, and nobody can do at the quality. You have to have perfect parts to be able to automate like that. You have one bad part, everything stops. Right. So well, it's amazing. I mean, you turn out millions of blenders every year, right? I mean, do you yes. know the number of how many yeah. a year? Just know, millions. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's better every year. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and I want to back up. Then, when you were younger, I know you talk about you uh, had a need for speed. You basically like to go really fast, you talk about. Was that an inspiration for uh, building fast appliances, essentially? Because you had other fast appliances as well, just trying to speed up that process. Your blender is known as the industrial gray. I mean, can blend sure. anything. That's what you're known for, right? Yeah, number one in the world. <laughs> and so was that speed part of you just always kind of on your mind? Is that why you engineered towards that? Or was that just something that was kind of an coincidence. No, I grew up, I'm very competitive, and so anything with wheels and an engine, I always have to have a big engine, little things. Even at BYU, my first year, um, my second year at BYU, I put a Corvette engine, a fuel-injected 375 horsepower Corvette engine in, a, in an Austin Healey, in a 1955 Austin Healey. So it did, in California, did wheelies in three years, oh, and wow. so it was the fastest car in Utah. And uh, I came here being very conservative put regular street tires on it, and in one week after racing a bunch of Corvettes, it was the end of the tires. I had my friend in California put my racing tires on a Greyhound bus for $10, ship them to Utah, back on the back of the car. And, <laughs> and I'm, but no, I've always been, from when I was very little, um, just from go-karts, I raced go-karts in the early days, and I could beat anybody. I didn't weigh a lot, you know, for to start with. And, uh, and so, very light and, and big engines, and so I could beat anybody on, on go-karts. And then I, I started drag racing motorcycles. So, And this always happens on Sunday, which is not a good thing. So I would take my, my Triumph motorcycle, and this is very hopped up, and at 15 and a half, I had a learner's permit so I could ride it. I couldn't ride anybody on the back, but I could. And so I pushed it down the street, fired it up, very noisy, fired it up and went across the Dumbarton Bridge, this is in the San Francisco Bay area, mm -hmm. went across the bottom tip of the San Francisco Bay to Fremont, where I drag raced, my, I went to the, the drag strip, 15 and a half, and they said, are you 18? I said, oh, no, no, but just call my dad, you know, he'll get permission. Now my mom goes to church, my dad never went to church, but my mom was getting ready for church, and I figured she's not gonna answer the phone. She answers the phone, and they said, your son's at Fremont Drag Strip, he wants to race his motorcycle, do, will you give permission? And I go, oh. <laughs> and she said yes, which just <laughs> blew me away. But anyhow, I went home from that with a uh, with a trophy, and then ended up having the record in Northern California in the M class drag racing motorcycle. Wow, so, that's amazing. Then I realized that wasn't the best thing to be doing on Sunday. After I got into other kind of motorcycle racing, when you're crashing and think, oh, this is not good. So. <laughs> I love that. Well, and you have a go-kart, a uh, little mini course outside your uh, headquarters here in Orem. Um, and do you, do you use that little go-kart? Yeah, we have a go-kart. Yeah, we have a, it's actually maintained by the city of Orem, owned by U.S. Synthetic, our great neighbors across the street. And it's a, it's a walking, quarter-mile walking <laughs> path. But when we get out there, nobody's walking on it because uh, we can go pretty fast. But yeah, my faster go-kart, which is even too fast for that track, was... 140 miles an hour. So, fortunately, my grandkid. I'm. I'll be 72 in uh, in July. Wow. So uh, some you're people. You're a very think young I'm 72. Old, old well, you told me you're a great grandpa. I was like doing the math in my head. I'm like, he definitely don't look old enough for that. But. <laughs> so we have a good time. But yes. Yeah, so I started on, um, you know, racing things, and then, um, but I really had. I was really troubled in school. I had a tough time going through school because I couldn't read. I'm ADHD and dyslexic. And as I go around and lecture people, um, with younger people and so on, I ask how many how many of you are ADHD and how many are dyslexic. And very rarely will you find you find someone who's got both those problems. So I read two books. I read T Model Tommy, which I think my mom may have helped me read, and then Bulldozer. And my wife more recently, a few years ago, got me both those books because <laughs> I can great. read now. Yeah. But so I had a tough time, and um, for that reason. Um, you know, I, I took all remedial classes in high school, there's an R next to all of them, and I got great grades. I had a four point average because I never missed a day of high school, never missed a day of grade school. Mm -hmm. I'm always there, uh, physically, mm -hmm. but not. So I got in a lot of trouble. I spent a lot of time in the corner, in the classrooms, and, and then, but later in high school, um, I took those classes, I got, had a four point average in those classes, 
but I also went to another school. I went to Sequoia High School and in Redwood City, California, and this is um, a school where they had a machine shop apprenticeship program, and so it, unbelievable shop, and so I was able to go there three hours a day and, uh, and then go to my other school, and I'd usually ride on my motorcycle over to the coast over to the ocean and back because I had a little break in between so it was a nice wow what a cool experience. Yeah, yeah it was great and uh, but so I, I did that for a couple of years and I was able to actually start my first business in that high school so we do all of the projects for for the year in two weeks I get a couple uh, half a dozen guys that really uh, were hard workers and wanted to make some money and so we produce motorcycle parts. Well, so you just happened to be at a high school that had this department where you could go and work on all this? Yes. There's no high school, and that one doesn't, that shop doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm. There's no high school on this planet that would have the machine tools and the equipment that this high school had. It was unbelievable. That's crazy, yeah. Is that when you kind of decided maybe to go the route of being an inventor? Or what do you think, why did you decide to oh, go I, into inventing? Was I, that just in your blood? Yeah, I just started. It's in my blood. My dad was an inventor. My dad, uh, we moved from... We moved from, I was born in San Francisco and moved in 1951 to the country, Menlo Park, which mm -hmm. is in between San Francisco and San Jose. And my dad went to work for, uh, for Dave and Bill, Hewlett and Packard, in the first building. So he did a lot of their hands-on stuff there. So um, he would, uh, so he you know, grew up like that. But no, from when I was, I couldn't even talk. And one of the first things I did, this is in San Francisco, is I had a piece of wood and it had a hole in it. And I said to my dad, bigger it. <laughs> so for some reason I wanted a bigger hole. I could hardly say, you know. I love that. Well, and you mentioned you have ADHD. I, people always joke with me, they're like, are you sure you don't have ADHD? And I said, I don't know, I got bored halfway through the test and I left, so that's my little joke about it. But the there's advantages, right? There's big advantages to having um, some of those what people would consider disabilities um, with dyslexia. I know I interviewed another guest. He was a former Major League Baseball player uh, a couple months ago, and he said that you know it really helped him in many ways. But in school, he just didn't learn the same way the other people were. But once he figured out how the, he was one of the smartest catchers in Major League Baseball for a decade, um, how did it serve you those quote unquote disabilities, ADHD and dyslexia in your business career? Yeah, it's a real blessing. I mean, as you say, Jimmy, when you, when you figure it out um, and understand it, you, it, I mean, they didn't know what it was when I'm growing up. I mean, this kid, something's wrong with this kid, you know, and he's never going to make it. And so I'm, you know, always, you know, put off in the corner. But, you know, it's a blessing when you figure it out. So um, it was really tough. I, I, I got through school and I went to my counselor and she said, um, D. Kent is her name. And uh, she said, so what are you going to do? And she knew I'd been accepted into a pre-apprenticeship, not only machine shop thing at, at Hewlett Packard, but, but they set up one that was a, a tool and die maker apprenticeship, which they'd never, I'd be the first one in it. So she knew about this. And so she said, so what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go to college. And she said, really? And she knows, I mean, I got great, I had a, a 4.2 GPA in the, in the, uh, machine shop class for three hours. So I got a great GPA, but no, and, and so I said, I said, well, I'm going to uh, uh, go to college, and she says, well, where are you going to go to college? And there, there's a college called CSM, College of San Mateo. We call it College of Small Minds. <laughs> and she said, oh, are you going to go to CSM? I said, no, I'm going to Brigham Young University in Utah. And she said, they won't let you in Brigham Young University. And I said, well, Ken Woolley said they would. And she, everybody knew Ken Woolley because he was valedictorian, he was a four, I mean, he was everything, pole vaulter, and um, he said, everybody knew him. And she says, oh, okay. I said, he's going to be my roommate. And so um, she said, well, what are you going to study? I said, engineering. She said, you can't study engineering. This was your advisor? Yeah, this, like, this is wow, my counselor. Back then, they're this basically is, just... <laughs> yeah, you know, you're a loser, yeah. you know? And I said, no. I, she said, well, you haven't had any math. And I said, yes, I was in your math class when I was a sophomore. And, uh, and, she, and she said, yeah, but you failed. I said, no, I got a D minus. I made it through. So that was my early high school days. And she, and she didn't realize that 
the three days a week in the other high school that I took trig. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I loved trigonometry and I was good with numbers. Even though I'm dyslexic, of course, I figured out early how to, how to deal with numbers. So, but my dad was very creative. My mother, likewise, was an inventor. She actually had, a, of all things, a, a mother with a patent, you know? Yeah. And so, but both my parents were very creative. And she, she when my dad was in Tinian, and he was in, in Tinian with uh, the B-17s and 19s and 24s. He was on the battalion that dropped the atom bomb over Hiroshima. Mm. And he was in a plane. I mean, he wasn't in the plane, the, the uh, Nola Gay, but he, um, he was in Tinian. And there, with all spare airplane parts and stuff, he built a still. So he made the whiskey for the officers and other people. <laughs> and he, you know, they had all these burned down palm trees and all this, all of this car, uh, charcoal around. And so he used that to filter the liquor in his in his still and all that wow, stuff. Wow, so very cool. Very creative. Yeah. And he made he made washing machines to wash the clothes there out of airplane parts. He made um, um, manglers to press clothing for the officers and stuff like that. So that's so what he, he was did. a popular guy. He was very popular. Group. Yeah, he knew who he was. And <laughs> Wash their clothes and get drunk a little bit. Yeah. You can make yeah. a lot of friends. <laughs> and, yeah. And he uh, and he knew how to, he played cards. He made a lot of money gambling and stuff. So that's my dad. My mom, while he was there, um, my mother was in the shipyards in San Francisco. And she was pulling, she had she had 30 some odd engineers. These are journeyman engineers, journeyman electrician. Mm -hmm pulling wire through these ships. She can read blueprints. And so she's doing all that and, and managing all of these guys. And so then unfortunately my dad my dad came back and and, um, and that was all good and grew up, had a great life, you know, growing up in the Bay Area. And then my father had cancer and died when I was eighteen. Mm. So that was tough, but my mother then she had to get a job. They, we didn't have a lot of money. I remember when my dad made a hundred dollars a week at Hewlett Packard. Wow, that was big. He was so proud, <laughs> you know. So my mom went to work at Hewlett Packard, and she ended up building all of the prototype boards. She had a, a dozen ladies that worked for her that would stuff the components, like you saw in our automation. Right, they do that by hand prototype boards. So she did all the board. She managed all the production of the prototype boards for Hewlett Packard back in What a great heritage yeah. for what you've created now, right? Yeah. And to be yeah. able to pass that on now to your kids and your grandkids and everything else. That's really a cool history of kind of how you got into all of this. And when you started out, you went to work for another company um, at first, and you created some of the first IUDs and motion sickness patches, really took that technology, that slow release technology, um, to the next level. Um, what, how did you decide to go into that particular uh, field, I guess you could say? Like, what was it that spawned your idea for the slow release patches and those different things? Well, I, I went, this is the time, 1971. <clears throat> I graduated from BYU in 71, and there's no jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had an opportunity in uh, Tri City area in Washington, uh, Pasco, Kennewick, and Richland, uh, at US um, at a nuclear plant and also uh, Byron Jackson pumps in Southern California. Two opportunities. The problem is I was stuck in the Bay Area because my good friend who drug me off to BYU, um, he, was, he, was, uh, he was getting his MBA and PhD concurrent at Stanford and teaching two days a week at Cal State Hayward. So once again, you see the extremes. I mean, I'm barely, I'm lucky to get through engineering in five <laughs> years at BYU. He gets through physics in a, three years and then he's at at Stanford. And so his wife, I, I was 50 on a lottery. I'm going to go to Vietnam front, you know, front lines. And so she talks to a draft counselor at Stanford and uh, he said, this guy better join something, get into the National Guard. So she starts looking in the phone book. She finds a National Guard unit near the San Francisco airport, San Bruno. And she says, oh, it's a transportation company. That's trucks and stuff. You know, that's tall. Yeah, yeah. So she signs me up. So, you know, so I'm ready to go. So I had to be in the Bay Area. So the only, I had an opportunity to uh, interview with a, a headhunter for the inventor of the birth control pill was starting a company. And his name's Alejandro Zaffaroni. So Alza is the name of the company, the first two letters of oh, his two okay. names. South American doctor, brilliant man. 
co-inventor of the birth control pill. So the concept was the control release of drug through permeable plastic membranes. So one, one idea was to release a day and a half's worth of oral hormone um, through, the, through a thin plastic wall in an IUD, which would last two years. And so I was the first, I was the 24th employee there. When I left there 604 and a half years later with two businesses that I started, um, I was the, um, there were 650 people. Wow. So it grew, and it grew from one building to uh, 12 buildings. And I had 14 offices in four and a half years. That's how much we, we Moving grew. around and growing. Yeah, and I had like 30, you know, a whole bunch of engineers and technicians. I was young yeah. and uh, under 30, you know. And so, but anyhow, so that was, uh, I got off the subject again because I'm... No, you're good. I, I let that go because it's, I'm fascinated. I'm just listening to a great story, so keep going. Well, so with the, the IUD, so you started working there and you worked with the IUDs, motion yeah. sickness patches. And then when did you decide, okay, I want to do something on my own, something that's kind of my company now as well? Yeah, I, I think it's really important, Jimmy, to when you, you go to work for someone and you just... You work really hard and you learn. You go to work for a great company and, and you work hard to learn. And then you, you um, uh, decide what you want to do. And it was great to, to have an income. It's nice after you know, going all, through, all the, through school and a mission and all this, having to come up with enough money. I mean, I bought and sold cars. I, I, did, I worked in the, in the labs at, at BYU and so on to, to make money. And fortunately, I married my income property because I married... Uh, a wonderful person who was a, a nurse at uh, uh, Utah Valley Hospital when they're having 500 babies a month. There. Wow, <laughs> it's probably the most in the world. Right? Yeah, right it was the most in, in the Valley. world. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so fun. In fact, I was the first in, in, in uh, 1979, I'm the, or ni 1969, I was the first father in with a live delivery because I said, why can't I be in when my baby's being delivered? And Harlow Smoot said, oh, we don't do that. What if we have to do a C-section? I said, just kick me out, you know? And so, anyhow, I was the first dad in for the delivery of my oh, son very... 49 years ago. <laughs> so, but anyhow, getting back to Alza. So, learn, you learn what you can. And it was, what a great experience. I mean, when I went to work there, I was the only one that didn't have a PhD or a med be a medical doctor. And these were some of the best... Um, the, the sharpest people around the world, the inventor of synthetic, Harold Leeper, the inventor of synthetic rubber, one of the co-inventors during World War II, and some of the top scientists in the world, husband-wife teams, no kids, and so, and it was tough. You know, when I was, when I was interviewed, um, this lady takes a look at my resume, and she said, this is not going to fly, <laughs> because, one, Brigham Young University, two, I was a missionary, and these people, a lot of them are Jewish, you know, and they don't want, you know, these Christians, so I'm quite so many Christians around. And then I'd served a, yeah, served a mission, and I had two children. And the policy at Alza, when I started, was you could have two live births that the insurance would pay for, and unlimited abortions. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I got put early on on the corporate communication committee when we had like 100 people because we were going real fast. And we changed that to, to limiting abortions to two and unlimited live births, which by that time I had a couple more kids. You know? <laughs> but anyhow, but so the first product, yeah, so that was one of the products I, projects I worked on. And then the other one was the motion sickness patch, the scopolamine motion sickness patch, the very first patch. And so with a doctor's knife, I cast on a piece of glass, really the parts of the first patch, and, um, and quite a story behind that. But we did all the testing, the slalom in the back, in the back with the nurse in, the, in a big maxi van with, uh, uh, with a nurse facing forward and the, the poor person sitting to the rear getting sick. So we had a placebo device and an active device, and you go till they get sick, and, and we'd fly people up to Alaska and come down on a yacht down the, the west coast and get people sick. Oh, we, we, went, we went steep sea fishing in Alaska three summers ago, me and all my high school friends, and I'll be honest, I'm sure we had plenty of your patches because we were all like, we were all thrown up in the middle of the boat, and without the patch, you're really a mess. Oh, yeah. I, that's a good testing ground. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I vouch for that. And we'd go out to a nice restaurant in San Francisco and take everybody out on a boat uh, dancing. And then, and then every 45 minutes, we'd turn the boat 90 degrees. And, and you know, the people on the active devices, you know, hopefully didn't throw up. And the ones on, uh, 
you know, the placebo, you know, so. That's right. so anyhow, that was a device, and then also an ocular uh, for glaucoma patients, an ocular insert called the Ocusert. Originally, with the, with the IUD, so we took a day and a half's worth of oral hormone, put it in the body of this T, and um, it was some silicone, and, and it was very successful. It's, in fact, it's been the only um, IUD on the market for over 40 years now. Now the Marine and a couple others have come on the market that last longer than two years, but the progesterone. And originally we called it the uterine progesterone system. But those guys that drive around in those brown trucks, they didn't like yes. it. They didn't like the acronym, you know. You, yes. So, yeah. So anyhow, that was very successful, and I was anxious to now with my knowledge that I acquired and and working around these brilliant men and learning all about you know chemicals and and uh, equipment, and that was my part really. But just having that experience and unlimited, we had a hundred million dollars to spend in in uh, the early seventies. Wow, what a luxury and yeah. to be able to have. You had a couple experiences then with your high school and then with this company where you had resources, right? Oh, and I think yeah. you've been quoted as saying, like, too many people quit their job too early to try to start Truly. something. Yeah. Um, is that part of the reason you have that belief because of how much you learned working for this company? Sure. Keep your day job. Learn what you can. Pay attention. Concentrate. Yeah. And um, that's a, yeah, it's a real lesson. Had I bailed earlier? You know, I'd end up being, uh, you know, having a motorcycle shop or something. Well, and so, I mean, because you took a lot of risk. I mean, you have for 30 years plus, you've been taking oh, sure. a lot of risk. 40 years plus. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, how did you make that jump to take that first risk? I think a lot of the people listening to the podcast, maybe they're in a job and they, you know, they enjoy it or whatever, but they do have big ideas and they want to explore those ideas. So how did you go from, okay, I'm in this great position, this great job, we're changing the world, we're making great products, but you knew there was something else that you wanted to do that's turned into this giant blend tech company. How did you make that jump in those that time when you were younger? Yeah, it's not easy, and that's why if you can do something on the side, um, it's really nice. But there's and ideas are cheap, and if you can learn all of these different um, uh, things, I mean, marketing and accounting and and um, HR. I mean, and I hate all that stuff. And <laughs> but you know, you learn how it works, and you find people. That really love to do those different disciplines, accounting. You know, I'm the same as you. <laughs> I just can't stand, you know, all the, all that part of it. I mean, so, um, so I just I learned a lot, even though I had no interest. But I learned the people, how to find good people that really know these things and love these different, these different areas. And so, it was a real blessing to be around, you know, so such good people. And so I knew what to look for. And then I started my first company. Um, the first one was a food packing company because people in the San Francisco Bay Area were storing wheat and other foodstuffs in plastic buckets. And knowing how gases and moisture go through the bucket and weevil comes alive, I thought, okay, there's a better way to do this. So I came up with a better way. And then while I'm doing that, I've already leased a building. Then I ran some wheat through my vacuum, my wife's vacuum cleaner. I thought, wow, instead of having these big behemoths wooden boxes that weigh 56 to 87 pounds, ones that 40 companies that were on the market at the time, what if you, instead of having a $150 motor, you had a $10 vacuum cleaner motor, which ended up costing $9, yeah. and then putting it into a, and making a grain mill. And so what I did, had done is I ran some wheat through a wife's vacuum cleaner, and then I blew it out into a pillowcase, I put it in a baby food bottle, and I had a dozen baby food bottles lined up. Every time it went through the vacuum cleaner, it got finer, dirtier, but finer. And so that led to the invention of the first high-speed wheat grinder. So the flour came out at 130 degrees instead of over 200 degrees, like the rubbing type stone mills. There was, there's a dozen advantages over this mill, over any other mill. And the, what it produces, it makes lighter bread and so on, less start, half the starch damage. Weighs one-eighth as much, takes up one-eighth the space, puts out flour twice as fine and twice as fast. Nobody could compete with it. Put 40 companies out of business. Your the mill. Did. Yeah, the mill <laughs> wow. did. And so I went to the number one at the time was Magic Mill. And this is Bob Peterson and Jim Harrison. And they had, so I put the Magic Mill 2 name. They had a big box like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Put Magic Mill 2 name on the mill and sold them 43,000 mills in two years. But during the first year of my two-year contract, this is the first time I got knocked off. They went to a guy in, um, uh, in Salt Lake, we're in, still in California, and this guy 
um, work with a wonderful patent attorney. And this um, patent attorney um, was, um, was able to, to circumvent my patent. He did a great job. <laughs> and, uh, and he ended up being our patent attorney. I was going to say, did you end up hiring this guy later? Yeah, later <laughs> it, we, uh, we hired him. But what he did is he circumvented. The problem is when you put 15 pounds of popcorn or 300 pounds of wheat through the Magic Mill 3, they called it, it would blow up. Oh. And it would just flip over on a table and bend all the teeth over. Because I have a patent on really heavy teeth on the middle, so it can handle it, you know, it wouldn't you know, break. And so uh, that lasted about eight months. They had to recall everything, and, but then they had the Magic Mill 3 Plus, and then they put a burr in the middle. Now, once again, the heat went up to over 200 degrees. It did starch damage to the flour, didn't make as good a flour. So, anyhow, so they, um, um, they copied me and they, they went to our vendors, and anyhow. It was really, we went from 85 employees down to myself and the secretary, wow. and I had to sublease the, anyhow, it was a real mess. How, how did you bounce back from such a, because, I mean, somebody just straight steals your product, starts selling it. How did you bounce back from that? What, what I did is um, um, we ended up having to move to Utah, because this is the bread baking capital of the world. <laughs> yes, it so is. we moved here, and I was able to scrounge up enough money and put a half a dozen stores within a half a mile of Magic Mill's most successful stores, including one in Las Vegas. Okay. And so, six months later, they filed for bankruptcy. And Rob Mallinckrodt, who was this wonderful attorney that, that helped them circumvent my, my mill, um, and which it didn't infringe, but when they had to make the changes, it still didn't infringe, but it was a bad mill. Um, and he ended up being the, my patent attorney on our mixer. Mm. They didn't pay their bills, and so, they, and this was a mixer, not a mill, so Rob took it on and did a great job. No, I gotcha. It's funny, it's kind of ironic that your IUD patch that helps prevent having kids was like very, because back then, um, people in Utah, LDS Church, didn't really believe in bread control. Right. So they were still spreading all the kids that were buying all the bread from your new product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truly. So, well, that's great. And so then um, you had, so you had, it called it the kitchen mill, right? And that yeah. was the wheat grinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when did you pivot into going into blenders, and when did this become blend tech? Okay, so we have the, we have the best mill in the world, we, and of course Magic Mill had, a, had the Bosch mixer, which is a great mixer, German made. The best mixers are bottom drive machines, the KitchenAid's horrible. You know, the top drive, you can make three pounds of dough, and so you, you want to make at least, you know, uh, eight or nine loaves of uh, pounds of dough. And, uh, and so uh, Bosch has the best one, so I thought we can make a better one. So the first thing we did is we imported one from Germany that was that was better than the Bosch, and I, with modifications we made in California, we sold that along with our mill. Then I thought we need to make our own, made right right in the U.S. right here in Utah, and so we developed the first you know really good uh, mixer made in the U.S.A. with our same motor, 28,000 RPM, so twice the speed of a Bosch. So, and we put a blender on it, and I went to my um, uh, Scott Barclay, our, our, my CPA, my home teacher, and I said, hey, how much money do I have? He, I, I said, we don't have enough money to put a blender on the mixer. He said, you've got to have a blender on the mixer. And so the blender, the, the mold to make a blender jar is, I called around and, and Oster and Hamilton Beach and Waring and, and Vitamix and all those molds cost at least $80,000 to make the mold. And and um, uh, the Vitamix one cost $112,000 to make the mold. Uh -huh. I thought, oh, and he said, you got $40,000. What are you going to do? And so most, most people on the market, most of the, oops, this is, a, this is a Vitamix jar. And so everybody has a handle that comes around like this. And so the mold has to split like this, and then it has to split like this. And so... Um, that's why this, you know, that, that the mold to make this plastic part, you know, is over a hundred thousand dollars, and so most of them were eighty. And so I came up with, and this is not the original one, but I thought, okay, what's an easier way to make a mold? And so this mold just comes apart like this. So those listening to it, explain that how that is different for those that are listening instead of watching. What's the? Yes. Okay. So what happens is most blender jars. Uh, the molds come away from the jar on both sides and there's a parting line 
and then there's also a core and a cavity. So there's, it's a four part mold to make a plastic part. Yeah. So I came up with a way to do it with just two, two parts in the mold and it just pulls apart. And so, um, and when you look at it, you say, well, that doesn't look like a normal jar because the handle doesn't come around and touch. But later on, it proved to be a real blessing because you can nest one jar inside of another jar. Mm. So when you have a uh, Starbucks, and we're in 64 countries with Starbucks, um, you can nest all these jars. Or you, you have 40 jars in a Jamba Juice or a Zuka or a Smoothie King or one of those. You can nest the, um, the jars together. Baskin Robbins, Hagen dazs Ben & Jerry's. So everything nests. The other ones that come around like this, you can't. Jar one and got it, and so that was so you could afford to make the mold with the forty thousand. Forty thousand, yeah, our first our first jar, and it was just it was great. <laughs> and the other thing, I thought, well, you know, if you don't have horsepower, now we have horsepower because because the the Bosch, for example, on the mixer um, was uh, uh, five hundred fifty watts. Ours is fourteen hundred watts. Theirs is fourteen thousand RPM on the on the on the blender side and ours is 28,000 RPM. So you can imagine what a violent blender that we Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, it probably wasn't your blenders because they weren't out here, but my mom, every time, whatever blender we used, every time she turned it on, the cable went out, the whole house shook. I mean, that's how they used to be, right? Yeah. I think that's why I love my blend tech so much now because I can turn it on. I mean, they're so convenient. They really are. It is such a genius product. And so you can see how, why it so quickly took on with the new design and why Starbucks and Jamba Juice and all these companies sure. immediately wanted that. So when you started doing the blenders, that kind of coincided with this boom in smoothies and health drinks and things like that. Was that a, a coincidence or did that help with you and sales and everything with you guys? Oh, it's wonderful. Because we're just, people really wanted a high performance blender. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had one that was you know, three or four times as powerful. And because when you have that much power, Jimmy, you, have, you can do a single blade. So it's a single blade instead of a crisscross blade which allows a, a product to get right down in front of the blade, but you need a lot of horsepower. The other thing you need a lot of horsepower for is if you have a thick blade that won't break. And we have the only blade that doesn't break. Right. Because Vitamix recalled 170,000 blades. Most people don't even know that their blades have been re, you know, recalled, but according to the U.S. Consumer Protection Agency, the blades can break off, cause serious lacerations, and even death. And so. Um, that's yeah, that's a good point. I, I would never even think about that, but in a smoothie or in a blender in general, if mm -hmm. the blade breaks off and you don't know, right. all of a sudden you're drinking it, you yeah. have some real issues. And, and a perfect example is in um, 1996 in a Baskin Robbins store in Santa Ana, California, a lady gulped her cappuccino blast and swallowed the end of a Hamilton Beach blade and had to have it surgically removed. Wow. And so they pull those out immediately. And well, yeah. speaking of losses, I mean, because you've been, you talked about where you've been knocked off before, and that's one of the reasons why everybody wants your product. They keep, I mean, you've been copied, you've mentioned to me how many times, you probably have a full-time attorney that you just handles these, you know, you having to keep people from trying to knock off your products, but you had a lawsuit that was pretty popular in the news um, not too long ago, five, six years ago. Yeah. What happened with that? Because you guys won a giant lawsuit. Uh, yeah. Largest one in the state of Utah. Yeah, 24.1 million. What happened is... You saw, I mean, this, this is what Vitamix had, and they're trying to be go commercial. I mean, we're the first ones to, to truly go commercial, and right. they couldn't compete with us because when you have, when you have a crisscross blade in the bottom of the jar and you can't get product down inside of it, and then you have, and it's really tall and it's a short little blade, so it can't really grab things. You've got to have a plunger. Mm -hmm. So. Vitamix is for 40 years, 50 years, has had to cram things down into the blade. And so this is what they had commercially. And, you, and you're in a Baskin Robbins store or something like, um, like, like Baskin Robbins, Hagen dazs and you're making a milkshake or something, and then people don't put the lid on, and so they cram the, they cram the plunger down in, and the blade cuts into it, and bacteria just breeds inside the plunger. And so it was a disaster for them. And so they went to, and, and we're just picking up all the business commercially. So we introduced, we just had introduced a, the wild side jar. And this was just taking everything by storm. And so the wild side jar is square, but it has one truncated wall under the handle. And so it, this, so one Memorial Day weekend, I thought, 
we got to solve this problem. So Friday afternoon, I went out of the shop. I took one of our four-sided jars, cut it all up, glued it together, it leaked like a sieve. <laughs> Saturday, it still leaked. I plugged more holes. And then I came in, never work on Sunday, or it would never be successful, but came in on Monday, made this four-inch blade, because in the past our blades were always three inches, made a four-inch blade with winglets. Mm. And, and we, it already had, I mean, I've always had winglets. The first one I built, I made the blade too long, so I bent the tips up vertical so they wouldn't hit the side of the jar. And then I said, okay, now it's time to really cut the blades off, cut the tips off and did that, it didn't work as well. So I have a patent on that, just like airplanes with winglets on and that the just of the came wings. by accident. You yeah. actually happened to have too big of a blade, so you had to bend it Yeah, bend it up, and it was really inspiration. <laughs> yeah, awesome. But anyhow, so we got this four-inch blade, and you could put anything. I mean, so I built this thing. The engineers came in on um, Tuesday morning and tested it. Nothing to this day has outperformed the wild side jar. So, because it has that flat side under the handle and it, it's a very disruptive, you don't get a normal vortex. Anyhow, it was just a miracle that it came out like that. It was unexpected um, result. And uh, I'm not supposed to say it was an accident because that would have got me in trouble <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. with the patent attorneys. <laughs> but, no, but it was a real blessing. So, anyhow, what happened is Vitamix, um, so we just rolled this out to, to Jamba Juice and the wild side jar and it was just doing great and so and we were charging you know when I first went to Vitamix I mean to uh, Jamba they called us into San Luis Obispo where they started they had 11 stores Howard Schultz the founder of Starbucks sat on their board and their their big goal was every time they put in a Starbucks we're gonna put in a Jamba juice mm -hmm. so and everybody there's like 10 vice presidents and not, nothing else but vice presidents <laughs> um, and it was called Juice Club at the time before it was Jamba and so just like our Zuga juice was called Blender's Juice Company. And I reminded them that there's two other ones already, one in Las Vegas and one in Palo Alto, California. You better change your name. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, so this is Jamba, and um, uh, it later became Jamba. And so they had all these different blenders they're testing, and they have our blender. And it ha it's an in-the-counter blender with a sound enclosure, and it just blew them away. They threw, they literally through all the other blenders up against a cinder block wall in an atrium that they had in their main office <laughs> in San Luis Obispo. That was it. And they said, we want exclusivity. You know, we want this for all the smoothie shops, you know, as we grow. And uh, I said, no, that's not going to happen because we've got our good friends in, in Utah that have, that have Zuka. And so they, um, uh, and they said, by the way, we don't have any money. I said, just give me a nickel. Every time you do a blend, give me five cents. And we'll give you half a dozen blenders in every store. We'll give you 40 jars, anything you need. Just give us a nickel every time you do a blend. They got up to 50 million blends a year. And I lowered it to three cents. I felt guilty because, you know, <laughs> and then we got down to a million and a half a year. And, you know, our, our blenders got, it was wonderful because just, you know, we just kept refining it. It lasts so well. And so then um, Vitamix came along to Jamba and said, we'll do your blends for two cents. Mm -hmm. That would save them a half million dollars a year, and they had 326 stores. So they said, okay, we'll do it if you'll give us a jar that performs as well as a Blendtec Wildside jar. No problem, they said. So this is what they produced. It's the same jar. It's the same <laughs> it's jar. The exact it's exactly same the same jar. height. <laughs> judge Campbell in, in Salt Lake, the federal court judge, held it up like that, and hmm, interesting. She calls this the, the Rolls Royce of blender jars. That's oh, what nice. Judge yeah. Campbell called it. <laughs> but exactly the same, same handle, they nest inside each other. I have two, two patents with 51 claims on this jar. And, and we went after Vitamix um, on just three claims, two on one in, in a patent and one on the other, to cover this with the wild side under the handle. So, and of course, lids are, Lids are interchangeable, um, you know, I mean, our lid fits on theirs, theirs fits on ours, and so that was the, yeah, that's, that's what they did. And so that got them um, into 100 countries around the world, oh, wow. and they made hundreds of millions of dollars off that jar. It took us six and a half years to, in litigation. And they, they now have, um, they're on their ninth law firm. We had Holland and Hart in Salt Lake, the Foster Boys, and I was with Brett Foster yesterday on another thing, <laughs> but I've spent, I spent 30 years in federal court 
trying to protect my intellectual property. Yeah, when well, you've got good property, people are going to come after it. Right? Yeah, they keep stealing what we do. I like it. Well, I want to kind of pivot. One of the fun parts about your business and when I first got turned on to you is, um, well, actually, I was at a business meeting about 10 years ago, and it was the first time you came in and spoke. There was about a group of 40 of us, uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs in a group up in, uh, up in Park City, and you came in and spoke to us about viral marketing. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of any kind of viral marketing. And I remember I was so fascinated because when I first, they said this guy was does blenders, I was kind of like, all right, whatever, you know. And then you walk in and I'm just like, okay. And then I watched your videos and you saw how many people were watching them on YouTube and you talked about how your sales, I think, had gone up eight or 900% because of the Will It Blend YouTube videos. And you were kind of one of those original YouTube sensations. I think you were one of the most watched videos when it first launched oh, or sure. those first couple of years. So. How did that come about? Was that pure accident that you guys were blending something and started recording it? Or was that, an, you just knew oh, this is a new medium that we need to explore? No, I knew nothing about it. I, I, I'm always trying to destroy things. I, I take everything to the limit. So, and I see what breaks and then I fix it. I make it so it doesn't break. And so, I'm, uh, so I hired, and we're an engineering company. Everybody, I mean, we got up to 40 engineers. Vitamix had, when we had 30, Vitamix had 7, by the way, and then they hired 50, and then they outsourced it because that mm -hmm. didn't work for them. But anyhow, so I was very, um, you know, always destroying things. So finally I hired a real marketing guy, George Wright, and he was a marketing guy, PR guy for Geneva Steel when they were going live. He was probably the last guy at Geneva when they shut things down. But George came to work for us, a great guy, and he saw this pile of sawdust, and he said, what is this? Oh, that's Tom just trying to break blenders, you know, cramming two by twos in blenders and stuff. And so he came to me, he says, what's my budget? And I said, you're the budget, you're expensive. He said, how about 50 bucks? And I said, okay. So he goes to Costco, buys a rotisserie chicken, gets a six pack of Coke, buys a bunch of marbles and rake handles and things like that, comes back to Blendtec and said, here, blend these things. And uh, so and we're going to film you. So I said, okay. And so, um, Kells Goodman was our video guy, we had, and he came in, and, and so they had, you know, they, they had talked this over together and decided this is a good thing to do, and so then they, um, so I blended all this stuff, they put it up, they, they came to me five days later, George came to me, he said, man, we hit a home run, <laughs> we have six million views on YouTube, and I said, YouTube? <laughs> had no idea what YouTube right, was, right. and then the next week we get a call from Jay Leno's people, you know, and they say, hey, we want you on the show, we'll, you know, fly you out, and whoever you want to fly out, and, um, and we want you on, you know, to do this. And so, here, so we show up on Jay Leno's show, and, and um, I did, I, I, I won't get into too much detail, but I, I blended a golf club. And there's another guy, there are two other guys there, they're twins from Las Vegas, and they're paid people. And this is, um, this is when I became a member of, uh, of, uh, Screen Actors. You have to be a member of Screen Actors Guild, so I'm a member yeah, of SAG okay. and I've been for all these years. <laughs> and uh, But anyhow, these guys, they, they do this for money. I thought, really? You get paid for this? You know? And I actually got paid for doing this. And, but they were, they would hit, a, they, they did all sorts of different things, but they hit a golf ball and it was just one of these real light ones, and the, and the other brother would catch it in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And so they had they had two different clubs. One was like a six, and one was like a nine or something. And so the one they had been practicing with is the one that, that Jay Leno said, "Hey, grab that off my desk and blend it." And and so, so then I say, "Well, isn't this the one that he just won that his grandfather won the U.S. Open with?" <laughs> and and he said, "Yes." And so I blend it. And so <laughs> so then it, it turned out. That usually they would get all, you know, like like four out of four in the guy's in his in the in the in his mouth in his brother's mouth, but now they had to use a different golf club. So I think they got one out of four or something. <laughs> he blended their good club. I blended a good club. So, but anyhow, um, Jay was a great guy, great host. My grand, my kids were there, and some, and, and it was just a wonderful experience. And then the next week, it's the Today Show, right before Thanksgiving, the right. day before Thanksgiving. So I'm out on the plaza with, with all the people, you know, and uh, it's freezing. <laughs> and uh, I blended six different things, just went from station to station with the different folks. What was, of all the things you blended, which was your favorite that you didn't know if it would blend, but it did? I think, well, my favorite one, I think, is uh, Glow Sticks. Oh. So I think it has 13 or 14 million views. 
and that was one. One I didn't think would blend was hockey pucks, and it was the worst um, smelling thing. These are just plastic hockey pucks. Right. right? It's the worst smelling thing. Which is there was natural because hockey players are the worst smelling thing <laughs> ever normally. And my buddies that. played in high school, my buddy Andy Klein and Chris, and man, they'd come out of the locker room and it was like, we love you guys, but fist bumps, no, no hugging today. <laughs> so that was one, but the, you know, it was 165. The, the most, I think, is the, the, the uh, iPad has, I think, 18 million views. Wow. But total, if you not only just YouTube but others, there's over 500 million views, so half a billion views. Right. <laughs> and uh, and then after that, um, and in YouTube, this is before Google bought YouTube, and so they're flying us, flying me around, and and, and Bev and so on, and and you know we're in all these green rooms, and it's getting kind of old, but it's you know still kind of interesting. Bev's kind of getting tired of you know, <laughs> doing it. fixing my hair and, and and stuff, but it was great, and then. Um, then we ended up going to, well, I mean, we've been to a lot, to um, well, all over the world, but uh, Australia on, you know, week tours, so go to all the different TV stations and radio stations, and I take the power down there, same way in England, because they have bad, they have their GFIs are not like ours that are right in the plug, they're on the whole building. Oh no, so, so you put so the power took, out in the whole yeah, building. Yeah, I took a whole radio station down, and, <laughs> and a TV, a whole area in the TV thing, had to go to a different set. And so yeah, same way in England, they have the same bad power, and so. But anyhow, we just recently, so we travel the world. I mean, I was just in Dubai, um, Israel, on Independence Day, and so I've been. They're very inventive there, and so they've invented flip flops and SD cards, and and so um, I did uh, videos with them and live TV, and you know, in, in Israel, and so that was a, a great experience. But um, so we go all over the world. And, uh, and blend things a lot in Asia and and even though you go to China that's our biggest market right is now. in China is in China yeah and they buy sixty percent of what they buy is our our the same blender you see in Jamba Juice mm. they pay two thousand dollars for it for in their for, homes yeah wow. for in their homes you buy it for eight hundred dollars here. <laughs> well, there's no other blender that they're really they're so quiet. You can literally yeah. close that thing and you don't even know you're blending something if you're in the next room over. But yeah. Um, they want the best. It's like, sure. I mean, there's more Teslas, like your car, there's more Teslas I see in China <laughs> than, than, uh, than here, yeah. than anywhere in, the, in this country. And, and Ferraris, they want, they, want, um, they want anything out of China. They don't buy ninjas and bullets and all the Chinese blenders and junk that we buy here. They buy Blendtec, they mm -hmm. buy Teslas, they buy Ferraris. Well, Blendtec, it's funny, my friends, like, because I sell homes, that's what I do for a yeah. living, obviously. And, Everybody, you give somebody a blend tech for like a giveaway. I do giveaways sometimes before, like I'll have a, I'll rent out a movie theater for my clients and we'll give a giveaway and I've done a blend tech a few times and people, you hear them like audibly, oh, you know, and I, I gave away, you know, tickets to Hamilton or I'll give away jazz tickets and I swear the blend tech was like the wives, you know, they just go nuts. But anybody can put one of those on your kitchen counter and it's a decoration that you don't want to put away. You don't have to put, it's like you said, because right. people know and Blendtec's the best. Was that part of the genius of the viral marketing? Did people say, well, if it blends hockey pucks and a broomstick, I don't think it's going to have a problem with my strawberries and bananas. Is that how it became, or do you think maybe that's why it was so popular, the, the um, videos? You know, some people don't get that relationship, okay. <laughs> which is really sad. Oh, and in fact, our competitor, Vitamix, would say, oh, well, yeah, sure, it can blend you know, hockey pucks and stuff and golf balls, but could it blend food? I mean, that was a big deal. In fact, their response right out of the shoot is they did one, and they didn't have any sound with it, and they really faked it, and they did some really stupid things. And that, the, the, what's so beautiful about, and also dangerous about viral marketing, is you can't, you can't make a mistake. If you make a mistake... They can't pull it back. No, you have to be so careful. You have to tell the truth. And, uh, or it comes back and, and really gets you. But anyhow, it's been a, um, and I, one of the biggest events, it was YouTube Live, and this is in San Francisco on a pier, and there were 3,000 people um, out waiting to get into this event, and no, none of the other people are out. They're in the green room and they're talking to each other and stuff. And we went out with Kells and a camera just to meet fans, and this is after a couple of years, you know, and this is the largest to this day. Unbelievable the way they broadcasted this mm -hmm. thing. But it was YouTube Live. And so we just go down through the, 
through the crowd and just and, and everybody knew who I was everybody knew who I was except I remember one lady and she said well who, who are you and the guy says come on you know who he is she really didn't you know but anyhow just video I don't have time I get pictures taken with people with no time to sign anything but then I was on stage with Katy Perry and so it's three levels of three level stage and the two rules the two main rules were you can't wear anything white because of the cameras. Oh, this sure. is bad. I mean, yeah, that's your signature code. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't wear anything white and you can't wear anything with a logo on it. Those are the two <laughs> rules. So it's a three story stage. Katy Perry's on the top floor and I'm second floor down. And they said, could you step back about two feet out of that from the front edge because you just glow? I mean, just standing out. And so then Katy came down and, uh, and she said, she came down the stairs with a bunch of cross dressers. And, uh, and then she says, don't blend me. And I, and I took the jar like this. I, this is bad. I took the jar like this by her rear end like I'm going to blend her. And then, and then I followed her down, and then we went down the runway together, you know, in front of all these people. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So, but anyhow, we keep getting it. And then, then they, we went to New York, and they show um, um, the guy that plays the, anyhow, just with all of the top YouTube people were there. They paid us all to be there. That's great. So. Did other companies reach out to you asking for ideas for viral marketing after that? Yes. Um, we have, yeah, big companies. I mean, first of all, like Nike. Mm -hmm. If you look at Will It Blend Nike, mm -hmm. they paid a lot of money for me to blend, blend a tennis a shoe. shoe, introduce a new shoe. Olympus, mm -hmm. uh, with a new camera, they're just introducing a new pen camera that has all these different capabilities. They had a million dollar prototype in this room. And they had a full time, a gal was just supposed to watch that. That was her responsibility. And I got a couple drops of water on it when I'm doing this thing, and she had a Kleenex and she wiped the water off. But I blend, I blend a, um, uh, a video camera, a, a, a sound recorder, I mean, the different things. And then, um, uh, and then when I pick the jar up, there's this, there's this camera. And then I pick the camera up and I say, hey, Bev, get the grandkids, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and they changed the camera a little bit, and so not only did they pay almost $100,000 for the, the little thing, and they wrote the script and everything, but they spent another $20,000 changing every frame because they changed the camera in my hand. So from when I pick oh, it up, wow. I said, hey, Bev, get the great, you know? <laughs> they had to go change the camera a little bit because it was different than the one they went oh, and nice. used. But anyhow, and then and Ford, Ford for the introduction, the Ford Fiesta, and that was a, that's a fun one. That have, probably has four or five million views, and then, um, and then Fritos, and and uh, anyhow, a bunch of those different companies would come to us, and some local people. We don't charge them quite yeah, as, sure. as much <laughs> because they're neighbors and friends. But yeah, well, so. it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, yeah, it really was the first time I ever heard of viral marketing. It inspired me. I remember being, I was probably 23, 24, 25, or whatever. And I just remember thinking, okay, I need to do something that goes viral. You know, to this day, I've never really done anything that's gone huge. But I just remember thinking of how genius that was. And it was one of my favorite um, lectures I ever sat in on seminars when I learned. And I, you know, kind of followed you guys' story ever since then. But, well, this has been a pleasure for me, Tom. I, yeah. think, I think people are really going to enjoy this. If you haven't checked out the Will It Blend videos, I've watched most of them. You got baseballs, golf balls, uh, broomsticks. Um, there's just there's like you said Lots there's over of hundred devices yeah, yeah a lot of different types of iPhones which they turn into dust by the way which is yeah. kind of interesting yeah and the worst one ever I just did a I did an X which I have been doing in in China and Dubai and stuff um, that's where it really goes and you know in China there's no YouTube there's no Google right they all know who I am still <laughs> they all know who, yeah I mean they just um, somehow it gets, it gets you through know, yeah. yeah. But no, the, the, yeah, so the, the easiest blending phone I've ever blended was an X. Mm -hmm. And it's the worst smelling, it's the most dangerous. It's the first time I actually felt it in my lungs and I didn't think I'd breathe. I gotta be, my, from the very beginning, when I did, um, what did I do? Anyhow, I said, don't, oh, I know, I did, I did marbles. Yes. And you have, and it's silica. And it'll give you instantly it just gets in your lungs. I mean you got to be so careful. Mm. Silicosis. And so in fact when I first did that I said don't breathe this <laughs> yeah. and it'll give you silicosis and they ended they edited it out that it'll give you sil <laughs> silicosis. Don't ever say don't breathe this again. But I've always that's my thing. Don't breathe, don't breathe this. this yeah. right. And so 
But anyhow, it, it, it's, that was the worst smelling one. The camera guy came back after a half hour, our cameraman, and he had a respirator on. No and it still smelled bad in this room, so don't ever <laughs> don't blend, ever blend your iPhone X. Your X. No. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah, don't blend. Just start blending things at home if you're listening to this right now. I don't need that on my conscience, but it will blend usually. So, <laughs> well, thanks again. That was yes. amazing and Thank pleasure, you, Jimmy. Thanks.